Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alaikum. Welcome to Perspective with me, Julie Ali. Super excited because it is Women's Month and we are celebrating women of substance all around the world. This time around, inshallah, we'll be crossing over. We're going to uh, Great Britain. We'll be hooking up with dear sister Yvonne Ridley and we're going to be talking to her about her life. The book she's written, her journey through life, she was also imprisoned by the Taliban way back in the early uh, 2000s. Um, she's written a couple of books. She's an ardent supporter of the Palestinian cause. And of course, most importantly, she speaks up or talks up for the rights of women and uh, women empowerment. She is our woman of substance this morning right here on Perspective. And it gives me great pleasure to welcome dear sister Yvonne Ridley to Perspective with me, Julie Ali. Assalamu alaikum to you, sister Yvonne Ridley. Welcome to the program. And what a delight to have you on the show. Walikum salam. And uh, wow, thank you very much for the introduction. That was uh, that was wonderful. Thank you. Well, going back a couple of years, Yvonne, um, you were somewhat and still are somewhat of a celebrity in the Muslim world. And this kind of takes us back to, to the time you spent um, in, prison, uh, in prison by the Taliban. Uh, then, alhamdulillah, shortly thereafter, two years after, you then reverted to Islam. You know, I'm just afraid we don't have enough time to cover absolutely everything about your amazing life. So let's start at the beginning and let's start with your life as a schoolgirl and where you became aware of women's issues, very especially the issue around Pal Palestine. I think you were nine years old at the time. And at that very tender age, you became aware of uh, the atrocities being perpetrated on the Palestinian people. How did that all come about, Yvonne? Um, it probably came about through a teacher who told me that, uh, that I wasn't good enough. Uh, it, it, um, he had a very negative impact on my life. And he was my careers master. And I remember being told that um, I was working class, that I would not really amount to anything because I was working class. And he tried to crush my dreams. You know, from a very young age, I wanted to be a journalist. And he said I wasn't good enough and uh, I couldn't go to university. And I, and he was so negative that uh, something inside me just rebelled. And I just thought, I'm not going to have this man tell me what I can and can't do. I'm going to do it. And... Um, so, Pamela, I did. <laughs> and it, it was uh, that job uh, which got me into the fix that, uh, that you talked about with the Taliban. But during, um, during those years, I was determined to become a journalist. And so I would read newspapers and... At the time in the 1970s, there were lots of hijackings and uh, th they were largely done by a group of people called the Palestinians. And this man called Yasser Arafat was their terrorist leader. That was the way the news was portrayed to me. And when I was about 13, somebody came to me and said, will you sign this petition to get justice for the Palestinians? And I said, why should we support terrorism? And, and these people, and she herself was a Palestinian, and she explained, she sat me down very patiently, a wonderful woman called Thea Karmas, and she sat me down and explained and told me the story of Palestine. And you well, were... I couldn't believe it. 
because when it's told to you, you nothing makes sense anymore, other than these people were uprooted by the barrel of a gun from their homes and uh, were cast out to live in refugee camps, which they're still living in today, more than 70 years later. It was an astonishing story, and the more I researched it, the more I became a supporter of Palestine. But that's also when I realized the power of propaganda. And this uh, set me on a course even more determined than ever to become a journalist. Yvonne, you are popularly known all around the world for your pro-Taliban stance. And that, of course, is due to the fact that you were imprisoned. And alhamdulillah, two years later, that experience truly changed your view on people as a whole, very especially brown people in the Middle East, and uh, the whole take on religion. Because two years after your imprisonment, you then embraced Islam. As you and I speak now, where does your heart lie? Is it divided between the Palestinian cause and the Taliban situation? And we're going to be talking about the situation of the Taliban women, because just recently we've heard that all beauty salons were shut down by the Taliban. And just when they had taken over, they had promised the Western world and their own people that they are going to allow women their rights, but obviously under their conditions. So the issue around Palestine and uh, the Taliban women's situation, it's two slightly different situations, or rather very different situations. And then let's focus more on um, the issue around the suppression of uh, Taliban women, issues of uh, their rights being taken away from them regarding schooling. They're not allowed to go to universities any longer. They're not allowed to work either, meaning that um, ordinary households are becoming poorer because their women are unallowed to go to work and bring in an additional income or possibly the only income for the said families. Well, you ask me where my heart is. My heart is uh, with humans. It's other people that uh, that make me um, the person who I am. And you called me a supporter of the Taliban. And the thing is, I'm not um, their biggest fan. I think they like me about as much as I like them. Oh. <laughs> I have um, never wavered from the truth when it comes to the Taliban. And everything that you've said is, uh, is correct, or this is what uh, we've been told, and that it's, um, it is true. But uh, Afghanistan has been transformed under the Taliban rule. And if we set aside the issue of women for the time being, just for the time being, wherever I've gone in the world, and I've met women in Darfur, in uh, Iraq, in Iran, uh, in Syria, in Palestine, right across the Middle East killing fields, wherever I have met women, they all want one thing, and that is peace and stability. And that has been delivered in Afghanistan. Now, there will be... Everybody jumping up going, what about, what about, what about? I agree with everything that you've said. Their treatment of women um, is despicable, and I would tell them that. When I went to Afghanistan last year, 
I uh, met with the education minister and using my little Islamic knowledge, really uh, criticized the regime and he agreed with me. The majority of the Taliban want the schools to open. Um, they don't want the beauty salons to close. I would imagine that a lot of the senior Taliban are getting hell at the moment from their wives, their mothers, their daughters, who want to go to the beauty salon. They did this in um, the late 90s when they were first formed. They closed the beauty salons. Of course, women, uh, they shouldn't have had to, but women are resourceful. And they reopened their beauty salons, but in side streets and away from um, the front street. There are about 20 of the 34 states that have said, no, we're not closing our schools. All the private schools are still run running, as far as I'm aware. But the trouble is, the international community has been using a big stick with which to beat the Taliban. And America, that was humiliated during 20 years of occupation by the Taliban, have put the country under an, a crippling economic siege. And uh, it's evolved. almost... Can I please ask you to hold? I thought we need to go for our first ad break. When we come back, you can continue, and there's lots more questions coming your way. Please do yes. stay with us. Okay. My woman of substance today is a working class girl turned celebrity. She is a journalist and author and also a politician. She is Yvonne Ridley, and we're talking about uh, her, her life. She has achieved so much in her life, and more importantly, she always holds up the flag for women's rights. Yvonne, welcome back, and let's continue our discussion uh, with your time in Afghanistan, your imprisonment uh, by the Taliban, what you learned during that time. Early on, I did say a support of um, a Taliban, but that, not, that is not in fact true. I mean, I think if anybody has given um, as, as the outside world an inside look of Afghanistan and the Taliban is Yvonne Ridley. You truly brought the situation of Afghanistan to not only the Muslim world, but the wider world as well. And I thank you for that. So let's continue where we left off just before the ad break. Yes, well, <clears throat> um, I would condemn the international community for putting Afghanistan under a crippling economic uh, situation where nobody in the world is allowed to trade with them. Nobody's allowed to do business with them. Um, they've got this broken economy from 20 years of war. But in true sort of Taliban fashion, they've ignored all of these challenges and they have uh, continued to rule the way they see fit. Now then, as a result of this, they have introduced a zero tolerance to uh, corruption. The Afghani currency is now performing better than the Indian and Pakistan rupee because of this zero tolerance. There's no such thing as backhanders or backsheesh. Um, this, is, this is how they do business. 
And now, rightly so, Yvonne, rightly so. Um, whilst we're talking about the economy, Yvonne, um, just after the Americans pulled out um, and they were trying to impose all sorts of conditions as far as the Taliban rule is concerned, one of those being that they froze all of the Taliban's assets, I think um, money uh, in US dollars and gold worth over, I think, 11 billion rands, which is still sitting in American reserves somewhere. Has any of that money ever been released? Because if they do, the country can truly get back onto its, uh, in onto its feet sooner rather than later. The Americans are overseeing an economic siege so brutal that children are dying, babies are dying. Children are dying of starvation, and that is because of Joe Biden. No other person, it's ironic, but it's another man, and, and he isn't Taliban, he is the US president. And these crippling economic sanctions are killing the Afghan people. Now then, when the Taliban took over, there was very little uh, bloodletting. Uh, the Afghan forces, all highly trained uh, by the Americans, just dropped their weapons, abandoned their weapons and, uh, and left. Uh, we saw the Taliban come into Kabul once the... Uh, puppet regime had gone. They could have charged into Kabul firing guns. They didn't. They could have looted the way that the Americans looted uh, uh, Baghdad. They didn't. They came in peacefully. They've been in for two years. And for two years, they've been able to run a country under these crippling economic sanctions. And they've done something that none of the European, none of the Western nations have been able to do. They've eradicated drugs. They have rounded up all of the drug addicts and they've put them in hospital. Wow. They, they have had, stopped Yvonne, the they production had a very of they had a very thriving poppy trade. Um, has that been done away with completely? And what have they gone. replaced those it's crops gone. with? It's gone. And the other thing they've done is they have reduced crime to virtually zero. Now, imagine this. When the call to prayer comes, every shopkeeper goes to his mosque to pray leaving his tail out in the open, leaving his shop doors open. There is no robbery. There is no thieving. So, you know, let's give credit where it's due. In under two years, they've got rid of most crime. They've got rid of drugs. And they are treating the drug addicts with their same zero tolerance policy. Um, it's probably wrong. I don't know, but it works. And again, going back to women, mothers and daughters don't want to see their children become addicted to drugs. They don't want to see their men become hooked on opium and, and other drugs. And they are delighted that drugs are no longer a blight on their life. Now, these are all positives that the West has never been able to achieve. If I wanted to go out and buy drugs, and, and obviously I'm, I don't take drugs, but if I wanted to go out and buy drugs, I probably wouldn't need to go more than seven miles down the road to the nearest town and, and buy whatever I wanted because um, our governments cannot and will not tackle the drug problem. So they've got rid of all of this. And furthermore, 
they're sitting on three trillion dollars worth of a mineral called lithium. Lithium is described by Elon Musk as the new oil. And they are in exactly the same position at the moment where Saudi was in the 1950s when it discovered oil. At the moment, they don't, they're not allowed to trade, so they can't um, mine this lithium from the ground. But the Chinese are in Kabul. There are lots of business people in Kabul, and they're all hanging there, circling, waiting for the sanctions to lift because so many people want to do business with Afghanistan. And under this zero drugs, zero uh, um, corruption, this country is going to launch and be a major influence if America will allow it. So the, the Western media only focuses on the issue around women's rights. Uh, and I guess they're going to get, hopefully get that right in time. Let's talk about the time you were imprisoned. What were the events that led up to you being imprisoned by the Taliban? The treatment you received and the reason why after you were released from prison, um, after quite a while, obviously, you decided that you're going to revert to Islam. Yes. Well, um, I was the chief reporter of the Sunday Express newspaper. There were 3,000 journalists in Pakistan, and we were all waiting for the build-up of the war, for the war to start. And it started on October the 7th, 2001. Um, I was in prison at that point, so I know what it's like to be bombed by Britain and America, and war is truly terrifying. And I made a pact then, when I was in prison, that if I ever got out alive, and I really didn't think I would, if I ever got out alive, I would commit myself to the anti-war movement. You cannot bring peace through bullets and bombs. And this is a very tough lesson that the Ukrainian people are learning now. This is a US-fueled war, and uh, it will not bring peace at the, the way it's going at the moment, and it's affecting all of us. Um, very much so, everybody in Africa, um, you cannot bring peace by bullets and bombs. And, uh, and as the Americans found out after 20 years, you can't win in, in a war where the people are determined to protect their lands. This is a lesson we know from the Palestinians. You know, these people don't have a military. They are facing Apache attack helicopters, cruise missiles, tanks, naval gunships, and they still continue to rise and resist. And their resistance, their heroic resistance, is to be applauded. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Yvonne, I need to interrupt you there. Uh, we're going for an ad break. When we come back, we'll have our last 10 minutes of talk time with you. I wish we had so much more time, so much to cover, but perhaps we'll get you on another time. But please stay there. We still have another, more, uh, another 10 minutes more of talk time right here on Perspective with Yvonne Ridley. Welcome back and the final segment with our guest from Britain. She's Yvonne Ridley. She is a journalist, author and politician. And she's now going to share um, her experience with us when she was imprisoned by the Taliban. And that then subsequently led to her reversion to Islam, inshallah. Yvonne, welcome back. 
Thank you so much. Um, sorry I got involved in, and trailed off into into Ukraine. <clears throat> but um, Interesting, my, interesting all the same. Thank you for sharing yes. that. Uh -huh. My treatment at the hands of the Taliban was uh, quite astonishing as far as everyone is concerned. I thought I was going to die. I'd been captured by what Tony Blair and George Bush had described as the most brutal evil regime in the world, a regime that hated women. And instead, during my captivity, I was uh, shown an, an astonishing patience and kindness, um, and, and they treated me with courtesy and respect. I was the prisoner, but they gave me the key um, to, to lock myself in on a night. And uh, uh, <laughs> that was uh, quite strange. I went on hunger strike and that really upset them. Every morning, noon and night, they would uh, urge me to eat. Uh, they would lay out food. Um, they were very concerned and I was totally confused by their behavior because I thought, you know, you're supposed to be brutal and evil and yet here you are being really kind. Uh, the local cook came in and started crying, <laughs> begging me to eat his food. And uh, this was very sort of, um, it, it, it was very strange. But I came out and I said, I was treated with kindness and respect, and this is not what the Western media wanted to hear. So as in true um, style, I was attacked. I was uh, made out to be somebody who was unhinged, somebody who was mad. Um, I went from award-winning journalist to uh, somebody who must wear a tinfoil hat and be bonkers. They did their best to destroy me. But what they didn't realize is that a seed had been planted in me about Islam. And I gave an undertaking to study Islam and to read the Quran if they would let me go. And they did against all the odds. And I started to read and, and the fulfillment of a promise turned into a spiritual journey for me. And after two years, I converted to Islam. And that really toughens you up. And I think that every Muslim in the world today has experienced some derision or, or hate because of their faith. But uh, there is a saying that if it doesn't break you, it will make you stronger. And that is so true. And uh, that, you know, is why um, I returned to Afghanistan last year and I went and saw the Minister of Education and said the first word in Islam that was delivered in the Holy Quran is Ikra read. How can we read if we can't be educated? And of course, you know, the, the Taliban uh, know fine well that uh, what they are doing to women is an Islamic. But I think, and it still isn't right, I think that they are using women to attack the West. And I think what they're saying to the West is, give us credit for cracking down on crime, cracking down on corruption, bringing stability and peace into a region which has never known stability and peace for more than 50 years. Just give us some credit for what we are doing. But of course, the West wouldn't. And the West has learned absolutely nothing from Taliban Mark I. They didn't like them then. They isolated them. They turned them into international pariahs. 
And of course, that worked well, didn't it? Ivan, we have a few minutes. They're doing more. the same again. All right, are we um, almost running out of time now. I still wanted to cover all of the books that you've written. We leave it for a future interview. But let me ask you how, <laughs> of course, I have a copy of that. <laughs> yes, well, it's, I can't get a publisher. I can't get a publisher for this book. Well, I think uh, you need, Yvonne, you need to come to South Africa and we'll find you a publisher. How's that? So you need to visit us here in South Africa. But I'm going to talk with you again in a future program about all of your books. But right now, I want to ask you, what is the sense you get from British people knowing who you are, Yvonne Ridley, a working class girl turned celebrity, and you're also a Muslim? And, and this in light of the fact that there seems to be this rise in Islamophobia all around the world. How are you viewed and how are you treated? Um, I am viewed still the same as that bonkers journalist who praises the Taliban. I don't praise the Taliban. I tell the truth about the Taliban and I acknowledge the good things that they're doing in Afghanistan. Don't shoot the messenger. That's all I would uh, say. But um, my faith and, and the support that I get from brothers and sisters around the world, um, really, it, it's like a protective shield. All, all the hate and the criticism just bounces off. And... Um, and I, I thank uh, my brothers and sisters for that. So please keep on praying for me. Never underestimate the power of prayer. Absolutely. One more thing, Yvonne, your final words on the Palestinian situation. How do you view it and in your, uh, you know, in your uh, following of this situation, how much longer do these poor people have to endure the occupation and the brutality of the Zionist regime? Um, the heroic resistance of the Palestinian people will, will end in victory. They will get their land back. You cannot have a perpetual war there. Just in physics, there is a beginning and there is an end. And Israel cannot continue this endless war of hate on the Palestinians. It's simply not sustainable. But I would say to the Muslims today, we need to support our brothers and sisters in Palestine and remember that our third holiest site in Jerusalem would have, Masjid al-Aqsa would have long gone now if it wasn't for the heroic resistance of the Palestinian people who under international law are allowed to fight back with whatever they have. And they have nothing but their courage and their own bodies and, and, uh, and sticks and stones. So don't knock them. If you can't help them, just be quiet. I have to get this final question in. Your sense of this rise of Islamophobia all around the Western world. You a revert Muslim and you've seen the beauty of Islam. It's a religion of peace. It's a religion of mercy, of forgiveness and of uh, service. Why do you suppose the Western world are so anti-Islam and anti-Muslim? You just have to follow the money. In a capitalist society, nobody wants an interest-free society. Um, it's greed. You know, if Islam uh, was practiced the way it should be practiced around the world today, there wouldn't be starvation. Children would not be dying uh, because they're thirsty or without food or because of diseases which should have been consigned to the 20th century. Um, we have to keep on promoting our great faith. We have to look upon ourselves as ambassadors of this great faith. 
Uh, we will be attacked, but hey, you know, you just read the history. Look at what our beloved Prophet Muhammad, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, look at what he went through in those early days, and look how Islam is now the fastest growing religion in the world today. Um, this is an astonishing achievement from a man who tried his best to bring Islam to the Saudi Peninsula. That was his ambition, and now it's global. Subhanallah, how beautifully expressed. Yvonne, it's been an absolute pleasure speaking with a woman of substance as yourself. I look forward to a future discussion regarding your books, and I'm serious when I say come to South Africa, your book will get published. Please keep us in your du'as, and as I've indicated, many more talks uh, in the pipeline with you in the future. Go well, and uh, assalamu alaikum to you. Alaikum salam. That was Yvonne Ridley. She is a Muslim. I have to say that up front. She is a Muslim. She's an author, a journalist, and also a politician. We weren't able to touch on all of those other aspects, but in a future program, we certainly will do so. Us, women of Substance in Women's Month, not only in South Africa, but the world over. I sincerely hope you've enjoyed the show. Thank you indeed for your company over the past hour. Till next week at the same time as always, assalamu alaikum. Not forgetting my wonderful production team, that is Darren and Clinton. Um, together we've brought you the show this morning. And don't forget, we will get together on a regular basis in our new time slot at 9.30 a.m. on a Thursday morning. Till then, as always, assalamu alaikum and khudafis.